Your attention, please. The opening session is about to begin. Please take your seats and silence your cell phones. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair of the Scientific Program Committee, Dr. David Shulman. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to San Antonio, and more importantly, welcome to CHESS 2018. CHESS has um, long been... Uh, something's off a little bit. Give me a sec. Uh, Bill, can you please? Thanks, man. All right. Let's see. Hold on. You like? Good, good. No? They, they like. No? All right. Sorry. Vice Chair says no. Thanks, brother. All right. Go. Um, as I was saying, welcome to San Antonio. I apologize. It's, it's not me. Um, chess has long been the preeminent source for international education. Providers turn to us for relevant, engaging, up-to-date information about the clinical practice of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. And we are really looking forward to showing off everything that CHESS can do at this year's meeting. The focus of this meeting is learn by doing. It's all over the place. And we're realizing that vision with more interaction than we've ever had at any CHESS meeting before. We have more hands-on sessions in our simulation center than we've ever had at any prior CHESS meeting. We have the availability of audience response systems in every session, thanks to the state-of-the-art app. And if y'all haven't downloaded that already, please go ahead and do it. It's incredible. We have more case-based sessions than we've ever had before. We have new roundtable sessions, and these are going to involve peer interaction. They're going to involve team-based learning where you work in groups. We have new bite-sized teaching sessions. These are great, and they're going to give you the most important content. And we've asked our speakers to limit themselves to just to 10 minutes per topic. Really just tight information. And sessions we've shortened. You know, we used to have 75 and 90-minute sessions. We're running everything at 60 minutes. And what that's allowed us to do is it, it's allowed us to increase the number of offerings we're bringing to you. So we have over 400 offerings this year. It's the most we've ever had. And we're featuring more than 800 faculty this year. And that's, that's still not everything. I'm a surprise guy. We still have some last minute surprises, including a session we actually haven't finished yet. And that's not, I know you all who know me think that's procrastination. It's not, it's by design. And you're gonna help us put that together and you'll get more information on that through the app. And let me give you just a little taste right now of something we have in store for you. Uh, <clears throat> some new technology. We've not had it just before. I'm super excited about this. Um, for the first time, and it's, we're going to show it to you right here, right in the keynote auditorium. For the first time, Chest is bringing patented kiss cam technology <clears throat> right here to the keynote auditorium. You know, I know you think I'm kidding because you know me. You're like, you know, Shulman, no, no, that's not what he does. Hold it for it. Folks, can we go to the kiss cam, please? Let's do it. Come on, let's find us people. Oh, hey, look at that. Okay. Kiss cam. So now you know what I can be capable of, and you're all really scared that I'm coming to you next. I get that. I get that. 
I want to thank uh, John Studdard, um, even after what I just saw. I want to thank John Studdard, who put his confidence in me to see this meeting through from ideation to fruition. And I hope I didn't disappoint. Um, people have been asking me over the last day or two, you know, how's it feel? How, where are you right now? You're feeling good? And the best way to describe not just how I feel, but how the, all the folks who work together on this meeting, the faculty and the staff feel, this is Christmas Day for us, but not as the kids. It's Christmas Day for us as the parents. We've bought a bunch of gifts for y'all. We've wrapped them. They're beautifully put under the tree. And we're waiting for you to open them over the next couple of days. And we're waiting to see what you think of the gifts. And I really want you to come to us. And if you see things that you don't love or that we could do better, please let us know. But just as importantly, if you see things that we're doing new this year and you think it's great, let us know that too. The, the, the great many faculty and staff who put in hundreds, if not thousands of hours to make Chester reality need that. And I want to recognize them. I want to thank them. And I can't thank them individually, much as I'd love to. But there are a few folks who work behind the scenes that I really want your indulgence to formally thank right here. Let's start with the members of my executive program committee, um, a great group. The Council of Networks. So the Council of Networks is a great, and Hassan Benchkroon, who, who has been chair of the council, did an extraordinary job this year in, in, in corralling them and helping them get a lot of the work done. I want to recognize the Education Committee, and Alex Niven, who serves as the chair of the Education Committee, has also gotten that group to put a ton of content together for us. The Scientific Presentations and, and Awards Committee, and that's led by Christina Reichner, the Training and Transitions Committee, near and dear to my heart, led by Gabe Boslett. And you just saw Bill Kelly a little while ago. Bill is the best program vice chair a guy could ask for, and he'll be an extraordinary chair at next year's meeting. A couple of staff need recognition, and, and these are not folks you may know, but you need to know them because what they do is great. So I want to bring them up. So let's bring up Rich Shu. So Rich, not onto the stage, although he's welcome to come, that's Rich. So Rich, just so you know who he is, he oversees the team that's in charge of all live learning operations at CHEST. He is truly a brilliant educational theorist. I came to him with a lot of crazy stuff, Kiss Cam. He never turned away an idea I brought him. And I, rumor has it, I don't know for sure, that they're housed on a bulletin board of Dave's crazy ideas somewhere at CHEST headquarters. There's stuff they can pull out for next year. Um, bring up Teresa Rodriguez, please. Teresa is the heart, soul, and, and Wonder Woman. She'll appreciate the reference of the meeting. And she's been that for a long time. She's the person that I and prior program chairs have gone to with questions about the meeting. And she's always got the answers. And that's amazing considering all of the things that go into this meeting. One of the great things about Teresa, and there are many, is that she has a new baby. I was going to say at home, but she actually has the baby here with her. And that's awesome. Um, but I want to recognize somebody who helped pitch in in her absence, and that's Lisa Alvarez. So Lisa temporarily handled a lot of Teresa's duties plus her own. And let me tell you what Lisa's responsible for. She's the technology person. So that app that you all have and use and you will love, she runs the team that kind of designs that. That's in addition to Teresa's. That's crazy. And the last person is a relatively, a relatively new person to chess, but that's Jody Eagle. So Jody is new to the team. Um, but she has an incredible history of experience in the industry to help, and she brought that to help us incorporate some really cool new ideas at this year's meeting. So I'm going to ask your indulgence to so please rise. Thank these folks for the hard work they put into making just the experience it is, and my job is here. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. I know they do as well. Folks, that said, um, we're now going to officially start the CHESS 2018 International Meeting. And it's my honor, my privilege, my pleasure to invite into the auditorium and to introduce to all y'all the new fellow initiates of the American College of Chess Physicians for 2018, led by my friend, my mentor, uh, apparently a great kisser, and more importantly, CHESS president, Dr. John Studdard. Ladies and gentlemen.
Wow, good morning. What a great group of young, educated leaders for chess. Uh, Shulman promised me a kiss from an Italian this morning. Uh, I just didn't know it was going to be Sylvester, uh, uh, Gerard Sylvester, uh, more importantly. Uh, let me take this opportunity to add my personal welcome to each of you to what really promises to be an incredible meeting and add my own sincere thanks to our program chair, David Shulman, and his vice chair, Bill Kelly, and to the entire scientific program committee, as well as our incredible chess staff for all of y'all's hard work over the past year in making this meeting a reality. Special thanks to uh, David. Uh, you know, David Shulman, uh, his bright intellect, his incredible organizational skills, his innovative spirit, his contagious energy are really expressed in this meeting's content and its delivery. You know, I have to admit that beyond my being my choice for program chair for CHESS 2018, David has really become a special confidant, a trusted advisor, and a supportive mentor to me this year as president. And I'd like to say thanks. I say this recognizing that Shulman was raised in New Jersey and acknowledge, as Mississippi author Richard Ford uh, once wrote, it's better to come to earth in New Jersey than not to come to earth at all. <laughs> However, David and his lovely family now live in Atlanta where David's on faculty at Emory. And while he hasn't yet quite learned to speak with a genuine Southern accent and to pronounce words such as diabetes, he is naturally blessed with Southern charm and a gentleman's manners. You know, chess is not only your connection to relevant clinical information, but also your connection to a community of innovative problem solvers who will inspire you. This morning, we welcome our 2018 fellow initiates into this community. Guys, take a look. They are the future of this organization. When you see them walking around the meeting uh, over the next several days, Stop and congratulate them, welcome them, engage them, show them what CHEST is really all about. CHEST 2018 is guaranteed to be a fantastic meeting. As we've talked about, the educational program alone uh, represents over 400 sessions with simulation and interactive learning components, interdisciplinary sessions, and original investigation presentations, uh, some with new unpublished data in science, as well as new diagnostic and treatment solutions. But you know, it's not only about education. This meeting is a time to connect with friends and colleagues uh, from across the world. And I'll absolutely be taking advantage of every opportunity I can to spend with old friends. Maybe y'all should take that opportunity also. Maybe tonight at the opening reception, uh, Tuesday night at the network and training mixer while we watch the Chess Challenge Championship, you know, I hope to see all of you there. I now declare the 2018 convocation ceremony to be in session. Officers of the American College of Chess Physician, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is my honor to present to all of you the 2018 Fellows of the American College of Chess Physicians. The FCCP designation recognizes you as a leader in chess, your profession, your institution, and most importantly, demonstrates a commitment to your patients. The new fellows this year represent one of the largest groups of new initiates in recent years, coming from 38 of our 50 states and 12 countries. We truly have a global impact, championing lung health and improving patient care worldwide. Each initiate has demonstrated professional contributions to chess and the field of chess medicine and has met the education and professional requirements for fellowship as approved by the Board of Regents. Each has been recommended by two active fellows and shown a true commitment to the practice of chess medicine and the chess organization. Each initiate has been evaluated critically by our membership committee who has reached the decision that they be awarded the FCCP designation. 
Please join me once again in applauding our new initiatives. <laughs> to y'all that represent our new initiates, welcome. Today you join a community of some of the most passionate and committed individuals I know. Others like you and I who have devoted their professional careers to improving lung health. Uh, right now, I'd like to ask Dr. Clay Cole and Dr. Richard Irwin, if they would, to join me on the stage. Clay, Richard, good morning. Good morning. You know, as is a tradition, we'll now administer our pledges to our new fellows, beginning with the Pledge of Fellowship, uh, new fellows, please remain standing and join me in this pledge. In accepting the fellowship of the American College of Chess Physicians, I dedicate myself to the mission and vision of the college. I accept the responsibility to be a lifelong learner in the disciplines related to chess medicine and others so that I can maintain professional and ethical standards of excellence and provide optimum care for my patients. I will work in harmony with the college as a teacher and advocate, and I will assist and support the college in global efforts to advance patient care, support research, promote diversity to optimize health, and foster health equity. I join my colleagues in the American College of Chess Physicians with pride and enthusiasm. Dr. Cole, our president-elect, will now administer the No Tobacco Pledge. Fellows, uh, please join with me in reading the No Tobacco Pledge unique to our organization. As a fellow of the American College of Chess Physicians and a leader in the most important struggle faced by healthcare professionals, the prevention and control of major health problems of lung cancer and cardiovascular and chronic pulmonary disease, I shall make a special personal effort to control tobacco use and to eliminate this hazard from my office, clinic, and hospital. I shall ask all my patients about their use of tobacco, and I shall assist the tobacco user in eliminating this deadly habit. I shall devote time to educating the public about the hazards of tobacco. I make this pledge to my patients and to society. Thank you, Clay. As a leading society in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine, CHESS makes an important and powerful statement to our patients, our members, the public, and the world. We embrace and advance patient-focused care. And today, we can all do that by reciting our patient-focused care pledge developed by past president, Dr. Richard Irwin. All healthcare providers in the audience, I invite you to stand and join the new initiates as Dr. Irwin leads us all in this pledge. Please join me. I will strive to provide patient-focused care wherever and whenever I have the privilege of caring for patients. I will also work to ensure that all healthcare systems in which I provide care are patient-focused. Patient-focused care is compassionate, sensitive to the everyday and special needs of patients and their families, and based upon the best available evidence. It is interdisciplinary, safe, and monitored. To ensure the provision of patient-focused care in my professional environments, I shall willingly embrace the concepts of lifelong learning, and continuous quality improvement. Please be seated. Thank you all. Yeah. Fellows, by taking the Pledge of Fellowship, you have committed to practicing the highest quality of medicine. Your obligation as a fellow to the American College of Chess Physicians is a commitment to a lifetime of learning, teaching, and delivering optimal health care. You are now entitled to display the much honored certificate of fellowship, which serves as a reminder of this obligation. The initials SCCP after your name 
indicate this same responsibility. Use them with pride. Today, you have joined an ever-growing and vibrant organization of more than 19,000 colleagues from over 100 countries in the pursuit of excellence in clinical practice, teaching, and research. On behalf of the American College of Chess Physicians, I applaud you and invite you to participate fully in all that CHEST has to offer. Thank you all. You know, what an amazing privilege it's been for me this year to represent all of y'all as the 80th president of the American College of Chess Physicians. You know, it doesn't seem possible that it was less than a year ago that I stood in front of many of you and others in Toronto, assuming my role as president of this amazing organization. It's been a phenomenal year for me personally, probably highlighted by the opportunity to meet so many new people and to grow existing relationships even more. What a great opportunity over the years since I've joined Chess in 1982 to observe and learn from so many great leaders and mentors, each representing different strengths and styles of leadership. I've learned so much from all of y'all, but I've also learned a lot from those who, I, uh, who served under me, uh, those such as members of staff at all levels, members of our leadership who serve as committee chairs, uh, as network leaders, as faculty representatives, all giving so unselfishly of their time and talent to this organization. I've had the pleasure to work with really a special Board of Regents, uh, experienced, engaged, professional, incredibly supportive, generally strategic, with great intellectual curiosity, and you know, perhaps most importantly, passionate about this organization. Uh, this board has been led by what is effectively our executive committee. Uh, this includes such great friends and mentors such as Stephanie Levine, our, immediate, our des present designate. Uh, and I'll even say, continue to say nice things about our immediate past president, Gerard Silvestri. Uh, Clay Cole, who is our president-elect, who you'll hear a lot more from in tomorrow's morning's opening session. Let me offer my sincere thanks to each of you for your incredible investment of time, and energy for this organization and your unwavering support. Also special thanks to Dr. Lisa Moore, who's been president of the Chess Foundation this year. Uh, Lisa has joined this group during the course of this year and her incredibly gracious but strong style of leadership and insight have brought great value and we greatly appreciate this. Special thanks to your families for sharing y'all and your time with us. And our whole staff, uh, what an amazing opportunity I had three times this year to address this whole group uh, at our headquarters in Glenview and an opportunity to uh, visit with many of y'all during those meetings 101. You know, those three trips will always be among my fondest memories of my year of service as president. Our entire staff, along with our leadership team, are so fortunate to work with such a talented executive leadership team. I'd like to give special thanks and recognition to Bob Masakio, who's recently stepped in to lead our executive leadership team and brings more than 25 years of experience with the AMA in multiple roles from executive leadership to operations to publishing. Thanks also to our Chief Financial Officer, Stratton Davies, and Ron Moen, our Chief Information Officer. Our SVPs, who represent the ladies of CHEST, and many would say our strength, Jenny Nimkovich, Chief of Staff, Sue Rimbo, Chief Marketing Officer, and Nikki Augustine, our publisher. As another Mississippi author once said, Barry Hanna, a man's got to do what a man's got to do, and a woman must do what he can't. Uh, you know, I'm sure Jenny, Sue, and Nikki would probably agree with that, and I probably would too. You know, I'd like to pause for a few minutes and take a bit of a non-traditional approach to this presentation. And rather than looking back and highlighting our year's accomplishments, to look forward to what we're doing and plan to do. The role of your leadership should be to think strategically in determining our mission and our organizational goals. Our incredibly talented staff's task is to operationalize how we get this done. 
both by taking chess classics like this annual meeting uh, and our journal chest and putting creative and innovative spins on these, but also working in new ways to provide what you, our members, feel you want and need is exactly what this group on our talented team excel at. For example, in San Antonio, as we've alluded to this morning, you're gonna see new, varied, and innovative ways to deliver education. Also, we've seen an increase in postgraduate program offerings with increased fellows offerings with approximately 240 uh, participants and exciting simulation offerings. During the year, plans and programs are being delivered to offer more live learning opportunities, simulation courses, and hands-on skills training at our headquarters and simulation center in Glenview. Chess board reviews this past August were broadened to include simulation, gamification, virtual patient tours, sponsored lunches, and was a great, great success. Our board review on demand continues to grow and provide content in multiple ways, depending on each learner's needs and wishes. Internationally, answering the request of our members and learners from around the world, a series of regional meetings are being planned to bring CHESS unique brand of education and innovative educational delivery to all of you. Our journal, CHESS, which is more than a medical journal, but really represents the strong foundation of the brand of the American College of CHESS Physician. Under the leadership of Dr. Richard Irwin for the past 13 years, we've been assured that our journal would grow, innovate, and continue to be the authoritative, respected, and trusted go-to resource for clinical pulmonary critical care and sleep providers. Peter Mazzone has been named this year to follow Richard Irwin in this most important role. What an incredible choice. Uh, Peter is young, incredibly bright, academically based, always prepared, always approachable, and all of this in an incredibly gracious, humble, effective style of leadership. Chess Physician, our monthly news pu publication, is quickly becoming a much anticipated, informative, well-read resource for all of us. Further exciting expansion and development of this is anticipated during this year. Chess Seek recently published our 28th volume of critical care and continue to grow the online Seek library. Guidelines, which are such a valued resource for our members, are continuing to be developed, dissemin disseminated, and implemented as we move forward. The Chess Foundation is continuing to grow exponentially on such a positive uh, trajectory. Tomorrow during the opening session, their plans will be highlight highlighted, but I'm excited to say and to see the continuing increase in funding for clinical research grants, community service programs, patient education resources, as well as uh, increasing use of multimedia and visual content. Much of this is made possible during the incredible support of our industry partners, with whom we are identifying common strategic goals and building increasingly collaborative relationships. And membership, where we're always looking to grow its value and explore, exploring with our international partners new models of group membership. As you can see, CHEST has a very busy year ahead of us, one that we've embarked on and look forward to. Again, let me change directions one more time and say that when I took the helm as president last year, I stated that our goals as leaders of CHEST should represent those of our organization but that our styles and our areas of emphasis are shaped by our individual interests, our personal experiences, and specific passions. Let me reflect for a few minutes, if I could, on a few areas that are affected by my perspectives and my passions. Last year in Toronto, in recognition of the critical importance of clinician educators, we recognized our inaugural group of distinguished chest educators. This year's distinguished group will be recognized during the course of this meeting. To continue in identifying what is needed in this area with specific attention to identifying gaps, barriers, and opportunities, Dr. Jack Buckley has led a task force in this space. Rather than being duplicative, we hope 
to complement what our sister societies and partners in this space are doing, making sure our clinician educators are getting the recognition and resources that they need. Another priority has been ensuring that, that we support our young leaders and young learners. Our Training and Transitions Committee <clears throat> continues to represent this group with great energy and continues to challenge all of us to follow their leadership in taking on issues in a passionate way. This group's leadership is helping to establish the CHESS Teaching Education and Career, Career Hub in our journal and helping increase the educational offerings for this group here in San Antonio and around during the course of the year. If you get a chance, drop by the training lounge during this meeting. It's a great place to hear really interesting perspectives, meet younger colleagues, and to recharge. You know, I'm really proud to say that I believe we've continued to make progress on both the professional and volunteer side of organization in the extremely important effort to understand, to continue to discuss and embrace diversity of thought and meaningful inclusion. A mechanism has been put in place to make sure that all of our committees have representation in this space, representing the value, values at all levels of chest, both on the staff and volunteer side. Also in this area, I'm really proud and excited by the really meaningful work being done by our volunteer staff and industry partners in our women in pulmonary space. You know, I, I must emphasize again, in my opinion, there's no finish line in this area. And there's always gonna be work to be done. We must continue to have a dialogue about this most important priority. But you know what gives me reason to have such an optimistic view of our future in this space is the impact of our young members. In the words of former President Barack Obama, part of what makes me most optimistic is if you look at the attitudes of young people across the board, they are much more comfortable with respecting differences. They are much more comfortable with diversity. So let's all continue to follow the lead of the young in this incredibly important area. One other area I'd like to also emphasize is how important I feel is the importance of relationships. You know, I believe that working on improved transparency and communication built on a foundation of trust and most importantly, friendship. I believe we're really in a great place at this time. In the international space with our partners in FERS, in critical care and the critical care societies collaboration, but also in our relationships with our sister societies, such as the American Thoracic Society, with whom this year we have a joint committee in the area of regulatory advocacy. But you know, we're poised to be able to more efficiently and effectively represent our members and more importantly, our patients. So many of the challenges that we face in chest medicine are so much bigger than one organization can affect alone. They instead require that we have to collaborate to put a face on pulmonary medicine, critical care and sleep medicine, in order to have the effective impact that we'd like to have. In closing, let me give special thanks to a, a few groups. As many of you know, my path to leadership here has been a bit unique coming from the private practice community side of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. Given the fact that non-academic providers represent about half of our membership, I hope I've helped to bring this group's perspectives and unique insights to the issues that CHESS faces. As many of you also might know in this area, I come from an incredibly traditional practice model in Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson Pulmonary Associates allowing me to be able to serve in the leadership of a group like this has its unique challenges. Special thanks to my partners and associates at Jackson Pulmonary for your generous sharing of my time and y'all's time and resources to help support CHESS. Special thanks to Bonnie Simmons and Anna Ketchum, two of my nurse practitioners, for y'all's care this year during my frequent absences. Thanks also to our CEO, Brian Hudson, 
who's figured out a way to kind of make this puzzle work most of the time. Thank you all for your support, your encouragement, and most of all, your friendship. Thanks to my most important family, my wife, Nancy, our son, Keith from Washington, D.C., our daughter, Elizabeth White, and her husband, Rick White, and our grandchildren, Caroline and Wynn, from Atlanta, Georgia. Thanks for y'all's support, your patience, and your understanding of my passion for this group and for our work, and for sharing me and my time to try to help advance the mission of chess. In summary, again, let me emphasize my appreciation for our clinician educators, my recognition of our young learners and leaders, and remind us all of the importance of relationships that hopefully reflect diversity of thought and inclusion. Now, please enjoy this incredible meeting. Take advantage of opportunities to learn in new, innovative, and also traditional ways, and make time for networking with old friends and for making new ones. Thank you all for the incredibly humbling opportunity to have served you this year, and thanks for your unwavering support of CHESS and our mission. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now recognize the 2018 award recipients. Each award winner has distinguished him or herself through outstanding contributions to clinical chest medicine and improvements in global health. Today, we recognize two individuals with presidential citations from Dr. Stuttered. Our first recipient is Dr. D. Robert McCaffrey. Dr. McCaffrey is a Master Fellow and past president of CHEST and has served both the college and foundation in countless leadership positions, such as the Council of Networks, Government Relations and Ethics Committees, and the Nominating Committee. Dr. McCaffrey's dedication to the organization and the profession have made him a leader amongst leaders at CHEST. Our second recipient of the President's Citation Award is Dr. Darcy Marciniak. Dr. Marciniak is a past president of CHEST and has served both the college and foundation in numerous leadership positions, such as the chair of the program committee, CHEST editorial board, the chair of pulmonary board review, and he has championed the global efforts of the organization. CHEST would not be where it is today without Dr. Marciniak's dedication to the organization and profession. There is no higher honor awarded by CHEST than that of Master Fellow. Congratulations to our 2018 Master Fellow, Dr. David Gutterman. Dr. Gutterman was nominated for this honor by eight past presidents of the organization who had this to say in their nomination. Dr. Gutterman's hard work, dedication and devotion to his profession and compassionate mentorship of his colleagues and students have made him a role model in the profession. Recognizing his talents, his exceptional service, his leadership qualities, and his enduring contributions to the college and the field of chest medicine, we know of no one else who is more deserving of this high honor. Congratulations, Dr. Gutterman, on this distinct honor. Dr. David Gutterman is also awarded the 2018 Distinguished Service Award. This award is presented to a fellow of the college who has made exceptional contributions to CHEST in terms of time, leadership, and service. It is bestowed to honor one who has devoted much to our organization. Doctors Suhail Rauf and Kalpalatha Kuntapali had this to say in their nomination of Dr. Gutterman. There is a lot that can be said of Dr. Gutterman's broad egalitarian outlook, humanitarian approach, and firm belief in the culture of caring, both for his patients and colleagues. Congratulations, Dr. Gutterman. Dr. Gada Borgelli is the recipient of this year's College Medalist Award. 
given to honor a fellow of the college for their meritorious service in furthering work in chest medicine. Dr. Borgelli is a clinician, educator, author, and leader. She has advanced the field of pulmonary and sleep disorders in women, particularly in pregnancy, through her research, presentations, and community outreach. In the words of her nominator, Dr. Carolyn D'Ambrosio, Dr. Borgelli is one of those unique individuals who have superior intelligence, academic interests, intellectual curiosity, and outstanding clinical acumen. Her dedication to elucidate the differences in pulmonary and sleep disorders in women and how they interact during pregnancy is aspirational. Congratulations, Dr. Borgelli. This year's Master Clinician Educator Award goes to Dr. Lisa Moores. The Master Clinician Educator Award recognizes long-term and significant contributions to chest activities by serving as chair, faculty, and holding leadership positions within chest. This honor rewards dedication to educational outcomes demonstrated through educational sessions publications research, and dissemination of education activities. For over 20 years, Dr. Moores has served the college and foundation in a multitude of different capacities, including serving on 11 committees. She continues to serve as faculty in professional development and clinical courses, participates in active guideline development, and currently serves as an editorial board member of the journal Editorial Board and as the CHEST Foundation President. Please congratulate Dr. Moores on this distinct honor. The Early Career Clinician Educator Award is presented to Dr. Amy Morris. This award recognizes the achievements of a clinician educator who has made significant contributions and is committed to expanding their growth in education has served as CHEST faculty, has contributed to the annual meeting, and has demonstrated commitment to education outside of CHEST. She currently serves on the Education Committee and is the chair of the Innovations Subcommittee. In the words of her nominator, Dr. Mark Tonelli, Dr. Morris has been an extremely active member of CHEST, developing a reputation as a leader in ultrasound training for pulmonary and critical care physicians and a resource for clinician educators throughout the country wishing to start educational initiatives and research. Congratulations, Dr. Morris. <music> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Richard Irwin, Master Fellow, to present the final award this morning the Alfred Sofer Award for Editorial Excellence. This year's recipient of the Alfred Sofer Award is Jean Rice, who retired in May after being the managing editor of the journal Chest for the past 14 years. The award is given to Ms. Rice for being the conscience of peer review of the journal and helping the journal navigate an increasingly complex world of medical publishing while managing to lead our very successful and engaging features like podcasts and ultrasound corner. Congratulations, Ms. Rice. <music> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome once again, Dr. John Stoddard to present the honor and memorial lecture recipients. Congratulations again to all of the award recipients. You know, in addition to those we recognized here this morning, there were a number of honor and memorial lecture winners selected by the Honor Lecture and Awards Committee. They'll be giving incredible talks throughout this meeting, and I'd like to take just a moment to recognize and congratulate them all as well. I now declare the Convocation Award Ceremony of the American College of Chess Physicians to be closed. 
With that, I'd like to invite my colleague and friend, Nikki Augustin, Chess Publisher and Senior Vice President of Publishing and Program Development, to join me in introducing today's keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Irwin. John, it's an honor to join you here this morning to introduce and welcome Dr. Irwin to the stage. When I joined CHEST, I knew of Dr. Irwin by reputation. He was said to be a perfectionist. Some may use the phrase demanding. And having now had the pleasure of having worked with Dr. Irwin as editor-in-chief of CHEST for the last 13 years, I can also tell you these statements are true. But the demand for rigor in the scope of the journal really comes from the weight of responsibility, of knowing that the clinical research published in CHEST has implications for the practice of medicine across pulmonary, critical care, and sleep. It impacts patients. It impacts people and their lives. Such responsibility requires integrity, and Richard has a high degree of integrity that he holds himself to, as well as everybody around him. In leading the journal, his editorial sensibility has been guided by a patient focus, by understanding the research with the best likelihood of improving their care, but also emphasizing the patient experience through humor and poetry and reminding us what this field is about. Thanks, Nikki. You know, CHEST is more than just a medical journal. CHEST is the face and brand of the American College of CHEST Physicians. Recognition and awareness of the journal as the face of the organization is an incredibly important aspect of what it means to the CHEST organization as a whole. While some of Dr. Irwin's most significant contributions to this organization have been through his years as editor-in-chief, He's also served as CHESS president from 2003 to 2004, obtained his master fellow designation in 2009, spearheaded our work on the cough guidelines, and served in countless leadership positions for the college and the foundation throughout the years. You know, this breadth of experience makes Richard uniquely qualified to present this morning as our opening session speaker. It is our honor to introduce to you and present to you, Dr. Richard Irwin. Good morning. Thank you very much, Nikki and John. As they have said, I am Richard Irwin, and I passionately believe in patient-focused care. And my goal this morning is to have you understand why. The format for my presentation will be my posing and then answering a series of questions, starting with, who is this person who will be speaking to us today about patient-focused care? I'm a pulmonary and critical care medicine specialist, and yes, for those of you who are looking, I am wearing cowboy boots. I got introduced to them in the 1990s during my first visit to San Antonio, and I've been wearing them ever since. Here is a picture of my first pair that I still have and wear. It's goat hide, because that was the only leather that I could afford. The picture documents, especially for you younger folks, that today is not my first San Antonio rodeo and that your boots or shoes or other things will last if you take good care of them. I am currently chair of critical care at UMass Memorial Medical Center and professor of medicine and nursing at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester, Massachusetts. I was born in New London, Connecticut in 1942 as the second child of Harold Irwin, an internist, and Sylvia Irwin, who was working as a social worker. 
For, again, you younger people in the audience, this slide shows that there was photography in 1942. <laughs> I have an older sister, Bobby. I graduated from Tufts College in 1964 and received my medical degree from Tufts Medical School in 1968. I received my residency training in medicine at the Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston and my pulmonary training at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City. I fought in the Vietnam War in Biloxi, Mississippi, <laughs> as a major in the Air Force. While I came into this world as a member of the traditionalist generation, my generational characteristics, I believe, summarized on the next slide, fit best with the baby boomer generation. For this generation, the events that define us are the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War, the Kennedy and King assassinations, the Cold War, the space race, the introduction and coming of age of television, and the women's rights movement. The core values are optimism, team orientation, personal gratification, health and wellness, personal growth, and involvement. The personality traits include being driven, being soul-searching, willing to go the extra mile, and having a love-hate relationship with authority. The communication and work style traits include showing respect, providing anecdotes when giving feedback, preferring face-to-face -face communication, requiring full attention during conversations, and having loyalty to work an institution. Well, having provided you with a sense of who I am, let me turn to my next question. According to the literature, what is known about patient-focused care? It's the care defined from the patient's perspective. Scholarly work has revealed that it embodies the three C's of communication, continuity of care, and concordance of expectations, and that means finding the common ground. Patient-focused care has led to significant improvements in patient outcomes. Patients preferred over physician-centered, technology-based, disease-focused models in which I was trained. I was trained in a model that had the patient as a passive receiver of medical intervention. With these brief introductory remarks, let me turn to my patient-focused care journey. It began when I was approximately seven to eight years old. It was then that I think I first thought about being a doctor and why. I remember that my dad frequently made house calls and on some of them, I would ride with him when it got dark. And in order to find the number of the house in the dark, my dad had the coolest spotlight on the outside of the Buick that he used. And I thought, wow, how cool it would be to use one of those. Also during those days in the 1940s, if you got sick, it was the custom, at least in my house, based upon no good data, that you got enemas. Because I used to get sick a lot, I had frequent enemas. This led me to believe that to be a doctor, all you needed was a spotlight and an enema bag. I remember thinking that giving an enema had to be better than receiving one. Even though it's a dark and scary place, not once, as a seven-year-old, did I think that you needed a spotlight to find the rectum. <laughs> While I summarize what the literature has to say about patient-focused care, what does patient-focused care really mean to me? I believe that it's the care we want our families to receive and all of the time. I don't mean to imply it's the care we only want just for our own families,
but everyone's families. So let me provide you with some specific examples that involved my family members, and let me preface these remarks by saying that while these examples and pictures were the same ones I used in my presidential address in 2003, I still hear and or observe that these things are continuing to happen. If my wife, Diane, shown here, or your spouse respectfully requests that a staff anesthesiologist rather than a less experienced physician be the one to insert an intravenous catheter prior to surgery, I hope that her wish will be honored. It's also my hope that should Diane forget to bring a referral from her primary care physician for an office visit with a specialist, that the office staff of the specialist will help her get the referral right then and there rather than send her home. If my 92-year-old mother, Sylvia Irwin, shown here, or your mother is 30 minutes late for an appointment in a hospital clinic because there's a long line at the registration desk, I would hope that she would still be seen despite being unavoidably late for her appointment. It's also my hope that when my mom calls her physician, the office phone is answered by a pleasant human being and that her physician returns calls when he or she says that he or she will. If my sister Bobby Pollock shown here, a 20 year survivor of stage four ovarian cancer, or your sister or brother travels two hours for an appointment and arrives at the doctor's office on the wrong day, I hope that she will be accommodated and seen rather than being sent home because she's cared for by a physician or physician group that practices open access care. Her story has been a special one for me because it taught me that overall statistics of a disease don't always predict what will happen to individual patients. I'm hoping that my brother-in-law, Dr. Norman Pollock, shown here, will never have to see another physician who is so insensitive and preoccupied that he fails to consistently call him by his correct name and fails to put the earpieces of his stethoscope in his ears when listening to Norman's heart. If one of my daughters, Rachel, Jamie, Rebecca, or Sarah, shown here, or one of your daughters are prescribed a new medication, I hope that the physician will ask them about all the other medications they're taking to make sure that there is no potential life-threatening interaction between drugs. Before I leave this slide, I have to tell you, those teeth cost a lot of money. <laughs> I have a feeling many of you have experienced the same. If my son-in-law, Dr. Andrew Coe, shown here, or my other sons-in-law, Andrew McIntosh, or Adam Slater, or your son-in-law, has to undergo general anesthesia and require anticoagulation to prevent blood clots from forming in their legs, I hope that they will be cared for by a physician who practices medicine according to the best available evidence and who embraces the concept of lifelong learning. If my son-in-law, Andrew McIntosh, shown here, or your son-in-law, is ever sick enough to be on life support in an ICU, I hope that they will be cared for by a compassionate physician who believes in interprofessional collaborative care and is knowledgeable about end-of-life issues and the special needs of the family members. If one of my grandsons, Jacob, shown here and now a 10-year survivor of childhood leukemia, or Benjamin, Truman, Bailey, Isaac, Emmett, or Asher, or my next grandson who will be born in January, or my granddaughter, we finally got one, Laurel, or one of your grandchildren has to be admitted to a hospital. I hope that the hospital has an active and continuous quality improvement program to ensure that the care they receive has the best chance of being of the highest quality and safe. 
Well, why have I defined patient-focused care in terms of family, mine, and yours? For multiple reasons. We should always, with the rare exception, when you hate your family, want the best for our families. It is defined in terms to which all physicians can relate. The definition of family, according to Webster's Dictionary, extends to the human race. And if we don't know how to provide patient-focused care in a certain situation, I recommend that physicians should ask themselves, what would I want another healthcare provider to do for my mother or father or wife or husband, children or grandchildren? The answer often will be the patient-focused care thing to do. Who made me aware of what patient-focused care is really about? Was it my teachers in medicine? Was it my dad, Dr. Harold Irwin? I can easily answer these questions. My formative years as a physician took place in a work schedule environment that involved being on call every other night and every other weekend for two consecutive years. Moreover, during the epidemic of the Hong Kong flu in 1968, I was on and barely awake for three straight days because many of my fellow interns came down with the flu. Because I always seemed to be in survival mode during my internship and residency, I didn't learn to practice patient-focused care during my training. Therefore, it wasn't my teachers in medicine who taught me what patient-focused care is all about. While I subsequently learned that my dad did practice patient-focused care, I never saw it because I was too kid-focused. I have lots of memories of going into our backyard on weekends to play catch with my dad and always having the activity interrupted by a patient phone call and his having to leave to take care of them. It made sense. He was in solo practice and was always on call. Therefore, I didn't learn to practice patient-focused care from my dad. So who and what opened my eyes to what patient-focused care is really all about? While my wife, Diane, an ICU nurse, made me realize that nurses provided a much-needed different approach in caring for patients, it was my mom. And she was the one who opened my eyes, and it related to the sudden death of my father in 1981. That was 13 years after I graduated from medical school. My dad died from a massive stroke while visiting us in Massachusetts from Florida. A few months later, upon returning to Florida, my mom called my dad's primary care physician and cardiologist and left messages that my dad had died. Weeks passed. When my dad's physicians in their offices never called or sent a sympathy card, acknowledging my father's passing, my mom was furious because she was left with the impression that my dad didn't mean anything to them. This opened my eyes to the realization of how much patients have emotionally invested in their physicians and that I should reciprocate in kind. My mom always shared with me some wise patient-related advice when I told her stories that taught me some valuable lessons. Let me share with you three particularly memorable stories upon which she commented. The first one started when I was 15 years old. I was in New London, Connecticut, hitchhiking, hitchhiking to Ocean Beach. An elderly woman picked me up. I sat in the back seat. We drove a block to a stop sign. She turned around and looked at me and she said, are you French? And I said, no. We went another block. She stopped at a stop sign. She turned around and she said, are you Italian? And I said, no. She pulled over to the curb 
She turned around, looked at me, she was full face, and she said, well, what are you? And I said, I'm Jewish. Get out. So I got out of the car, I hitchhiked some more, I got a ride to the beach. 30 years later, I get off the plane in LaGuardia, New York, for those of you who are unaware of the state of New York, got into a cab and I was going to give a talk at Montefiore Hospital. Got into the wrong cab, the gentleman immediately screeches away from the curb. He's obviously on some kind of drug. Seemed to be going the back roads, we got off the highway took corners on two wheels. I think we were going 40 to 50 miles an hour around corners. And he's jumping around in the seat, playing with the wheel, and he turns around and he says, you Hispanic? <laughs> and I said, see. Sí. <laughs> so when I told my mother this story, she said to me, so what did you learn? And I said, don't make the same mistake twice. <laughs> she said, I agree with you. It's okay to lie when your life is on the line, <laughs> but never lie to the patients. The second story relates to how I met my wife. I met my wife under a bed in an ICU. I was an intern. In those days, if your ward patient actually became critically ill, they ended up in the ICU. So there wasn't a separate ICU rotation, at least the Tufts and Wingham Medical Center in, during those times. And I was picking up Betty, who was anuric. She's had subacute glomerulonephritis. She was on peritoneal dialysis. And as I approached Betty's bed, I noticed that there was a nurse on her hands and knees. This was the day of short skirts. <laughs> Diane's head was down trying to figure out why the dialysis fluid wasn't coming out faster than it was. I immediately said, I have to see what the other end looks like. <laughs> so in those days, we were dressed all in white, starched. I could barely bend, but I managed to actually get on the floor and I crawled under the bed. And I came face to face with Diane. She jumped back. I had no idea what to say. But what I ended up coughing out was, I think I want to have children with you. Don't do this at home. <laughs> she didn't speak to me for months, um, but finally um, I lucked out and she decided that she would go out with me and then we got married. So I told my mother the story and she said, you never know when opportunity will knock. She also told me that she was pleased that I married a nurse because Diane the nurse would teach me to become a more caring doctor. The last story that I'd like to share with you um, was actually during a trip to Singapore. There were, in the presidential line, four of us. There was Udaya Prakash, there was Sid Brayman, there was myself and Paul Qualley. We all gave talks. I managed to be the last person to speak, and there, was, there were questions from the audience after each of us spoke. The moderator said, are there any questions for Professor Irwin? There was a hand in the back, shot up, the gentleman jumps up, he's called on, and he gets the microphone and he addresses me. He says, Professor Irwin, we have heard many speakers from the West. You are the shortest.
my mother said to me, well, what did you learn from that? And I said, don't take yourself too seriously, to which she said, good boy. <laughs> I also learned that it's important to have members of our team all share the same passion of providing patient-focused care. So here are two such members of our team, actually also possessing nice teeth. Carrie Krikorian on the left, a clinical nurse specialist, and Cindy French on the right, who was a clinical nurse specialist, who became a nurse practitioner, who became an independent researcher after obtaining her PhD. Together, I don't believe Carrie, Cindy, or I ever failed to let patients and their families know how important they are or were to us. And I don't believe that as a team, we have ever missed going to the calling hours and or funeral of one of our long-term patients who passed away. In this regard, I'd like to share two more memorable stories that actually took place during calling hours. The first one related to the passing of Doris, and the second to the passing of Eleanor. With respect to Doris, I think as a team we took care of her for about 20 years. It had become my custom when traveling distances to let patients know that I'm thinking about them, to bring them back little gifts. And I especially wanted to do that when I knew that the patients were getting near the end of their lives. During a trip to Turkey and then visiting Ankara and the museum there, I bought a little oriental rug that I gave to Doris when I returned. She was deeply touched. She loved the rug. And about six months later, Doris passed away. As Cindy and I were approaching the open casket at the calling hours, we noticed that the oriental rug was laying across Doris's chest. And on top of that were two Almond Joy candy bars. I don't think she loved anything to eat more than the Almond Joy candy bars, and it became clear to me that her most precious possession turned out to be the oriental rug that I gave her. About three months later, Doris's oldest daughter came to clinic. She brought some baked goods that she had made for the staff and for me. And she and I spoke in the corridor of the clinic for just a few minutes. She said to me, you know, Dr. Irwin, I need to tell you we didn't bury the oriental rug with mom. There were four daughters, and I'm the oldest, and I got to pick first of whatever Doris had for possessions, and I picked the most meaningful one. The second story relates to Eleanor. This was probably about maybe 15 to 20 years ago, Eleanor passed away. During those days when patients actually seemingly just had a respiratory problem, they asked me if I would be their primary care physician, and I was. And then, because Eleanor was so dear to us, I took care of her husband, I took care of the daughter, and I took care of the son. When Eleanor passed away, I remember approaching the casket with Carrie, Cindy came a little bit later, but she can confirm that Carrie will tell you that what I am about to tell you is a true story. As we approached the casket to give our last respects to Eleanor, the daughter came up to me with a camera, and she said, my mother loved you to pieces, we all do, so that we can remember the relationship that you and my mother had could you please get into the casket so I can take your picture?
There are three C's embodied within patient-focused care. Communication, continuity of care, and concordance of wishes. Finding the common ground. I was not going to get into the casket. <laughs> the common ground for me was to get my head as close to Eleanor's as possible, but outside of the casket, <laughs> and allow Eleanor's daughter to take our picture. And that was finding the common ground. She was less happy with that, but it still made her happy. Well, why is it so very important for me to take a broader view of the definition of family? It's because of Betty Beckman, shown on this slide with her husband, Darrell, who I remembered as Betty Jones, my fifth grade teacher. She was the first person outside of my home who made me feel good about myself. I reconnected with Betty when she sent me a letter in 1997. The letter read, I don't know if you're the Richard Irwin I'm looking for, because my husband found three Richard S. Irwins in a telephone directory of 88 million Americans. I decided to send this letter to you because your father was a doctor, you were born and raised in New England, you told me in the fifth grade that you were going to be a doctor, and you were the only Richard S. Irwin of the three who was living in New England. If you're my fifth grade student, please call me at the number I'm providing because I want to return your Hebrew school workbook that you gave me. <laughs> she did give it back to me. I was very proud of the work that I did in this workbook. And there is no question that I had a crush on Betty. Through the generosity of the chess organization, I was able to invite Betty and Daryl to join my family as my guests at the annual meeting of the college when I became inducted as the president for 2003-2004. It was quite a memorable event for Betty and I because it was the first time in 50 years that Betty and I had last seen each other. How do we get physicians to embrace and practice patient-focused care? This is a task for all stakeholders, but especially for me and you and medical societies. In my case, as is often the case, it took a family healthcare calamitous event to open my eyes to what patient-focused care is really about. While medical schools are now incorporating experiential learning and simulation centers, and using standardized patients so that medical students and all trainees can be introduced to the concept in their formative years. It's important to remember that the hidden curriculum is always in play. This means that we must always realize and remember that others are watching us and how we act. And if we're not careful, impressionable ones can learn bad behavior from us. That's the hidden curriculum. Additionally, patients and family members also have a big role to play. You need to become informed about best practices and patient-focused care standards and let physicians know when your needs and expectations are not being met. Because our medical society was willing to also play a role the CHEST organization in 2003 decided to join the patient-focused care revolution. It was at the convocation ceremony that year, shown here, that the patient-focused care pledge was first recited by all who were in attendance. The format, as you no doubt saw, is obviously different than what we're doing now. While we've already read this pledge aloud this morning, I'd like to explain why we chose 
the terms and words that are highlighted on this slide. The term patient focus was chosen over the Institute of Medicine's patient-centered term because it felt more decisive and action-oriented, and I believe it still does. Compassion was chosen over sympathy and empathy because the word compassion, most people don't appreciate this, not only embodies being sympathetic, but also imparts that there's a desire on the part of the provider to do whatever can be done to ease the situation. If you want providing care according to the best available evidence, you want giving patients what they deserve. And if you want providing interdisciplinary or interprofessional care, you want tapping into the group intelligence that distinguishes the best teams. If you want monitoring the outcomes of your patients and your practice, you can't be certain that you're providing the best care possible. Because the standards of care change, as healthcare providers, we must continue to study and learn. If I provided care today the way I did in 1968, no patient in their right mind would want me to care for them. Lastly, because none of us is perfect or works in a perfect system, we must always be looking at our monitored data to strive to do better. To do this, we must embrace continuous quality improvement. I'd like to leave you with two pieces of advice. The first comes from a Jewish proverb. The days are like the pages of a book. Think and think often about how you want things to be remembered. If you want to be thought of as a patient-focused care provider, you need to constantly work at it each and every day. In this regard, if you don't know how to provide patient-focused care in a certain situation, as I have previously said, ask yourself, what would I want another healthcare provider to do for my mother or father or wife or children or grandchildren? The answer has a really good chance of being the patient-focused care thing to do. Lastly, because none of us is perfect, and all of us can have a bad day. Understand how to apologize in a cleansing and healing way. Such an apology is composed of four parts. Acknowledge the offense, explain why it happened, do so by showing remorse and sincerity, and lastly, make an attempt at reciting a reparation. By that I mean by offering what you're going to do to make up for it, or what you're going to do to minimize it ever happening again. Because it's so important to apologize the right way, I encourage everyone to read the book on apology by Aaron Lazar, who had been the chancellor at our medical school. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Irwin. Thank you all for joining us this morning to kick off in such an awesome way Chess 2018. So go and enjoy y'all's day. Thank you again. Awesome. Thanks.